I'll be talking now about linear time invariant systems and ideal filtering. This is a recall to ideas that you must have seen before in the prerequisite class to digital communications, but it will give us some vocabulary and some ideas that we'll be seeing in the digital communications class. So in particular, this is covered in section 1.6 of the Sklar uh, book, uh, pages 33 to 44 in the most recent edition. So we'll start with section 1.6, which covers uh, filtering. First of all, a linear system. Uh, a linear system is, by definition, a system where if I uh, put in a linear combination of two inputs, I get the same linear combination at the output. So if x1 generates y1, x2 generates y2 in my system. Then if I put at the input the combination of a times x1 and b times x2, what I get out is a times y1 and b times y2. A simple example would be an ideal amplifier, so that the output is just the gain of the amplifier times the input. A counterexample would be a square law detector, where uh, instead of a, a nonlinear, uh, instead of a linear response, we have a nonlinear response. The second part that is important in the systems we'll be investigating is the uh, time invariance. So a time invariance of a system means that if you put an input lag, the same lag will, how, will occur at the output. So if x1 of t generates the output y1 of t, if I delay the input x1 by a certain amount tau, then what comes out will be the same output, but exhibiting the same delay. So for instance, when we say a system is time invariant, that means that if I go in and run an experiment on Monday, if I go back on Tuesday and run the experiment, I'm going to get the same results. So the system is not changing with time. So for instance, there could be aging in a system, which would be something that um, a component could have a certain behavior in the first year of its life and the 10th year of its life, it could be different. So that would be uh, one example. So an example of uh, a time invariant system would be, again, an ideal amplifier where the output is just the input times the gain. A counter example would be one that is modulated. So for instance, if I take the input times the sine function, uh, the output is the input times the sine function. But if I put in a delay and I don't put the delay into the sine function, that means that uh, I will get a slightly uh, out of sync, out of phase uh, system. So that would be another example of time invariance. So a linear time invariant system is a typical system that we would investigate. And we call a linear time invariant system, sometimes we just call it a filter. So as long as this black box, the system, is both linear and time invariant, then we can look at it uh, mathematically as a uh, black box system, which is defined by a quantity which we know, which we call the impulse response, which we typically will write as h of t. So h of t would be a unique identifier for a linear invariant system. So even if this system was composed of different components, as long as all these components contributed to have this system behave in the same way, from a mathematical point of view, it wouldn't matter to me uh, which components were used. So uh, we can use we can describe the system by the impulse response in the time domain. However, what's interesting is to also look at the frequency domain interpretation of a linear invariant system, time invariant system, or a filter. And in this case, you can imagine taking the Fourier transform of the input to the system, the system itself, its impulse response, and the output. So if x of t is the input in the time domain, x of f, or capital X of f, uppercase x of f, would be the frequency uh, spectrum, or the Fourier transform of that uh, input uh, time signal. and uh, the output, again, it would have its own Fourier transform. And if we took the impulse response and took the Fourier transform of that, what we get is something we call the frequency response. So that would be the H of F. So a linear time invariant system can be represented in the time domain by an impulse response and in the frequency domain by a frequency response. The input-output relationship is quite simple in the frequency uh, domain, and that is one of the reasons we like to work with filters in the frequency domain, because it's a simple uh, multiplicative relationship. So the uh, frequency response is equal to the ratio of the input 
uh, spectrum divided, excuse me, the output spectrum divided by the input spectrum. Or equivalently, that I could uh, um, say that the um, output, excuse me, the output uh, spectrum is equal to the input spectrum multiplied by the uh, frequency response. So multiplication in time domain. So that's nice and easy. And what do we have that happens in the um, time domain? Well, first of all, we know that the uh, impulse response and the frequency response are related by the Fourier transform. And so if I take the inverse Fourier transform of the spectrum of the frequency response, I would get the impulse response. So this is just a little bit of the definition. And if you recall your Fourier analysis class, that means that in the uh, time domain, if I have this multiplicative behavior in the frequency domain, that means that I would have a convolution operation in the time domain. So uh, y of t equal x of t convolved with h of t in the time domain. So linear invariant systems can be described equally in, in uh, these two manners. And we can choose to use the uh, time domain analysis or the frequency dom domain analysis per uh, our convenience. So whichever is more convenient to us, these are equivalent understandings. And just uh, to give you a reminder again of the definition of the convolution, this operator that uh, is relevant in the uh, time domain, the convolution operator, so f of t convolved with g of t is by definition the definite integral from minus infinity to infinity of one of the signals uh, multiplied by the other signal with the delay, and the uh, integral uh, is over, uh, in this case, this dummy var variable of u. So it's uh, also uh, been described as the uh, flip and correlate. So here we take the uh, g, uh, this t minus u, because we have minus u, and u is the operator for the integral. That means that the waveform of g is flipped. And then we uh, are, are um, uh, correlating f and g against one another and integrating over uh, all of u. And of course, we integrate over u, and what's left is a function of time. So the convolution of the time signal f and the time signal g gives us a new time signal, even though this is a definite integral because we still have the, the t variable. So again, this would be um, familiar to you from your Fourier analysis. Another uh, concept I'd like to recall is that there is an identity operator for the convolution, and that is known as the Dirac delta function. So this Dirac delta function, if I put that in as one of my operators, then, excuse me, as one of my functions, when I take the convolution of any function and the delta function, I get the function back. So it's the identity element for a convolution. So the uh, name impulse response comes from uh, this fact that the uh, Dirac impulse is um, uh, what you get at the output is just the response of the system when you put a, an impulse, a perfect impulse, a delta function at the input. So if I take as my input to my linear time invariant system a perfect impulse, the delta function here, when I convolve it with the uh, system impulse response, what I get out is the impulse response. So it's response to an impulse. Impulse in, some filter, you're going to get the impulse response is the output signal. Another interesting result coming from Fourier analysis is uh, Parseval's theorem. And to apply Parseval's theorem, we first are looking at a function in the time domain, which is an L2. So we call this an energy function. So by being an L2, we mean that the f of t can be integrated over, uh, the square of it can be integrated over infinity and leave a finite function. And we call this an energy function because uh, if we take in the f of t, we it, uh, allow it to be a complex function. So this 
uh, absolute uh, value really should be interpreted as the module. So the module of this potentially complex signal squared can be integrated over all time and yield a finite uh, value. So if we interpret this uh, f of t to be an impedance, uh, excuse me, a voltage going through an impedance, uh, a unit impedance, then we can think of this as being the uh, total energy of the signal. So an energy function is a function or a signal whose energy is finite. And what's interesting, what Parsable's theorem says is if the function is an L2 function, if the energy is indeed finite, in that case, I can calculate it equivalently either in the time domain or in the frequency domain. So if I uh, look in the frequency domain, I would take the spectrum, complex spectrum, module squared, integrate over all uh, frequencies, um, normalized by a factor of 1 over 2 pi, and that will uh, give me the same answer. Okay, so it's interesting. I can calculate the energy in the time domain. I can calculate the energy in the frequency domain. But the real power of the Parsifal's theorem is it gives us a way of interpreting the frequency content of a signal. So we can think of E of omega here as being sort of the uh, density of the energy as a function of frequency. And so this is a very powerful idea because now I can find a way of taking the total energy in the system and start talking about, in a reasonable way, how much of that energy is concentrated in certain frequency bands. So this E of omega is called the energy spectrum. So it is what we're integrating. So it is the module of uh, the spectrum squared, normalized by 1 over 2 pi. And the energy in a particular frequency band is defined as being the integral across that frequency band of this energy spectrum. So again, this is uh, possible for us to quantify energy content by frequency. Very, very powerful tool. So now we can look at spectral density at the output of a filter. So going back again, this is for one signal. And now what happens when we take this signal and we put it through a filter? Well, what happens to the spectral density at the output of that filter? So let's assume that our linear time invariant system has a frequency response of h of f, and that the spectral density at the input is gx of f. That would mean that the spectral density at the output is given by this simple uh, equation. So it is indeed the input spectrum multiplied by the module squared of the frequency response of the system. Very important, again, to help us interpret the uh, behavior of the output uh, of a filter as a function of the frequency response of the filter. So if a frequency response of a filter is zero in certain bands, that means that the output must be zero in those bands, among other kinds of behavior conclusions you can, can, can lead from this. So for instance, suppose we look at a, a particular kind of input. Suppose we put a cosine signal into our linear time invariant system. What this tells us is the output is just the... Uh, uh, input, the cosine, the same frequency uh, that was input will be output. There will be a certain change in the amplitude and a certain change in the phase. So this is a direct result of uh, having a, a single frequency come into the system. If I'm only putting one frequency in, that the only part of this whole response for the system is what happens at that one frequency because that's the only thing I'm putting in. So I put in this frequency F0, and I look at my frequency response, and I see that it enters into this output only two times, one in adjusting the amplitude of the signal, and it's the frequency response amplitude uh, module at that frequency, and the phase gets shifted again by the amount of frequency, uh, phase at that value. That means that if I put in a cosine, I also get out a cosine. However, it could be uh, phase shifted and amplified or attenuated. So this leads to this concept that I alluded to earlier, that a linear time invariant system always conserves bandwidth. 
So a linear system cannot create new frequencies. So whatever frequency is put in, I can get those out, but I can't get new ones. Uh, so that means that if I have at the input what we call a band-limited signal, a signal whose uh, frequency content is non-zero only over a finite interval, in this case that means that the output signal must also be band-limited because no new frequencies can be created. So very important uh, property of a linear time invariant system. Another concept that is uh, important uh, in communications is the idea of causality. And causality is uh, really uh, a way for us to step away from a completely mathematical construct about how we can manipulate signals and bring some uh, real-world situation into it. So although I can define a function which has... Um, uh, infinite support in time goes from minus the creation of the world to the end of the universe. Um, in fact, it's very difficult for me to create such a function in the laboratory. But uh, how does this relate to causality? Let, let, me, let me focus back on, on this ba ba basic idea. The de definition of a causal system is the one where at any specific time the output is a function of the input at that time or before, but never a function of what comes after. Okay, so this means that I cannot have a linear time invariant system, cannot predict the future. So if I put in a constant signal and the box does not know that on Tuesday at 3 p.m. I'm going to suddenly put in a uh, step function, for instance, into my system. So it can't anticipate, it can't predict the future by reacting to that input, which will come at a later time. A linear invariant system can only respond to what has happened previously. So, yeah, this just means it is a um, uh, type of system that we can actually create in the laboratory. And what that means, there are many examples. A, um, a perfect uh, uh, amplifier is one, and the another would be a modulator. Another is a... Um, uh, excuse me, uh, um, uh, this kind of filter, I won't give it a name yet, let's say this filter. Here's a counter example, which is a smoothing filter. In this case, the output is over from minus time to a certain time. And here it is, the current time before and previous. So this is what we would maybe call a smoothing uh, filter. And this is possible to construct in the lab by having some delay that is introduced to it. But this assumes that we have, have worked the system. But causality means that it is a system which can be uh, created in the laboratory in theory. You know, it could be constructed because it's not violating physical properties. Again, I can create a uh, mathematical construct that I can manipulate, um, which is uh, not causal, but a causal system. I can create a linear, for instance, this is a linear uh, time invariant system, but it is not a causal linear time invariant system. I hope I said that correctly. I, I think I may have misspoke just, just now. So once again, causal systems are subsets of linear invariant, uh, time invariant systems, and uh, these are uh, some examples. So it could be either uh, a causal system or a non-causal system. And linear time invariant systems that are not causal are mathematical constructs, which can be very useful in our analysis. But uh, you must realize that, uh, of course, when it's time to build it, there they would not be possible to build it without uh, taking some introducing delays and other aspects. Okay, so I've talked to you about linear time invariant systems. I've talked to you about some of their properties. And now I'd like to, and I said that they're interpreted as filters, and there are sort of some common filters, some common linear time invariant systems, which we like to discuss uh, in uh, digital signal processing and in particular in communication systems. So for instance, an ideal transmission line. This would be a line which uh, basically does not distort the input signal. So it's undistorted. That means that whatever the input is, is the same thing I see at the output. 
there may be a delay introduced and there may be some attenuation introduced. So the amplitude could change and the time could be shifted. But other than that, if I put in a square, I get out a square pulse. If I put in a, you know, whatever shape pulse I put in, I get the same shape out. Maybe the uh, height is adjusted. Maybe there's some delay, but that's it. So an ideal if I take uh, this relationship and I look in the uh, frequency domain, I can take this uh, time domain equation describing the behavior of this particular linear time invariant system and say, what is the frequency response of the system, which is described in the time domain by this equation? And I would get uh, this uh, quite a simple result that the frequency response is just uh, multiplying by a constant, this k, and it involves a, a phase shift. So you can see here's a phase shift. So a delay in the time domain we know is a phase shift in the frequency domain. We know this from our Fourier analysis, uh, meaning that the amplitude of the frequency response is a constant, k, and the um, phase of the frequency response uh, is linear and the slope is 1 over f0, where f0 is 2 pi times t0, the delay. Another important filter which we like to uh, discuss is an ideal low-pass filter. So this is the frequency response of the uh, ideal low-pass filter. Here's the amplitude. We can see that within a certain pass band, the signal passes with no change. The amplitude is 1. However, outside of this pass band, which includes DC, the signal is completely attenuated to zero. So we could write this uh, uh, low-pass filter in the, uh, this equation where rectangle is a rectangle of width 2 times fu uh, centered at the origin, and fu would be the upper frequency in uh, this representation. So low frequency components pass without change. High frequency components are completely zeroed out. This is by definition an ideal low pass filter. Now, if we were to ask, is this ideal low pass filter, uh, what does its, we've looked at what its frequency response is, and we could ask, what is its impulse response? And the impulse response, if we take the frequency response and take the inverse Fourier transform. Well, we know from Fourier analysis that a rectangle in the frequency domain corresponds to a uh, sync function in the time domain. Time domain sync function. Though, so this is a function which is got infinite support in the time domain. Uh, of course, there's a fall off and exponential decay. However, you know it does in theory have non-zero content for all time. So this would be the frequency response, and you could ask, the, excuse me, the impulse response, and you could ask, is this uh, the impulse response of a causal system? And the answer would be no. This is not the impulse response of a causal signal because it would respond to future events as well. So ideal pan-pass filter, same idea as a low-pass filter, though, but instead of having the origin included in the pass band, now we're operating at some uh, elevated frequency. So there's a lower and an upper frequency, and in that um, band, the signal is passed without alteration, but everywhere else, the signal is zeroed out. So now let's go back to this idea of a low-pass filter. And what we can think of is, before I talked about the ideal, we had an ideal band-pass filter, an ideal low-pass filter. And when we say ideal, what we mean by that is sort of like infinite rise time. It's a rectangle. It's ideal. It's either 0 or 1, 1 in a certain pass band. Now, if I think about a low-pass filter as one that attenuates low, uh, excuse me, high frequencies and leaves low frequencies mostly untouched, it could be have this general behavior but not be ideal in the sense of 0 and 1. Uh, so one approximation to a low-pass filter, which is quite simple, is an RC uh, low-pass filter. And the frequency response of such a circuit, an RC circuit, would be 1 over uh, 1 plus j to pi uh, f 
times tau, where tau is the time constant, the RC time constant. Now, if I took this frequency response and asked what would the impulse response of such a circuit be, I would get this uh, one-sided exponential decay. Uh, so I would be zero here, and then uh, start from one over tau and decay uh, with time. So that's the impulse response. And uh, if we were to look at the output for this, uh, suppose I had a rectangle, a perfectly um, uh, a perfect uh, square impulse that was put into an RC circuit, well then what I would get out in the output instead of being a nice square pulse would be something, the form that's uh, given here. So it's possible to use um, uh, Fourier analysis uh, to resolve the differential equations and find out for that given input what would be the output. For instance, I could just do uh, the convolution of these two operators. Um, the impulse response, which is a one-sided decaying exponential and a square impulse at the input, and I would be able to come up with this, this result. So um, we said that the definition of causality was that the output at some time is only a uh, function of the input at, at one time. And one way that I can check is a system causal. Since a system to be causal means it cannot be a function of the future, that means that although the convolution is an integral from minus infinity to infinity, that must be the equivalent of doing an uh, integral from minus infinity to the time, current time t. Because otherwise, uh, if I leave it in this form and it varied, it was not equal here, that meant that depending on what happened after the current time would change the function y of t, and that would not be causal. So we know that every causal system, the output can be uh, written as the integral from minus infinity to t uh, instead of the minus infinity to infinity. So that means that the integral from t to infinity must be zero, which means that um, the impulse response of the uh, signal uh, must have this one-sided characteristic. So this is the causality uh, requirement by definition. And here we can see that the RC low-pass signal has a causal type shape. It's completely zero until time zero, and at that point it grows. So that when I put it into, and then it, it has some behavior afterwards. So this is the impulse response clearly identifiable as a causal impulse response. When I look at the uh, ideal low-pass filter and I see this sinusoid, of course, I can see right away here that this is not a causal system. So if I would like to have a system with the behavior which looks like an ideal filter that completely cuts off high frequencies, what could I do? I certainly can't construct this because clearly it's violating causality. Well, it's quite simple. I, I know that this has some sort of exponential decay. And so I can do uh, the operation of truncating it and delaying it. So I take this sync function, for instance, which has infinite support, and I truncate it after, here I did it after uh, one side low, but if I wanted to make it a better and better approximation to an ideal filter, I would allow many um, uh, side lobes to be included. But anyway, I truncate it. And when I truncate it, then I'm starting to make it a causal filter. Of course, the last thing I have to do is to introduce a delay so that this truncation occurs at time equals zero instead of occurring uh, at a negative time. Uh, so truncate and delay is a way to build a causal filter to approximate the ideal characteristics that you would like to see in your filter. So that's all for the review of uh, filtering and system, linear time invariant systems.